we should be here. This is The Daily Breakdown. Catchy name, I know. I came up with it myself, patented. And we're going to talk about some of the world's games. So let's just introduce who's on the show first. I'm Thorin. I work for On Gamers, also known for my witty tweet game. I think that's what people most enjoy about me. <laughs> but Spellsy here. Spellsy's Hello. like a, a massive nerd. You know those guys with like the pocket protector and the really good calculator that you could like program a computer game into? He comes up with yeah. stats. He like pours over. Th- he tries to see through the matrix, but that doesn't really work in games. You have to sort of go off your... You have to open your heart, Spellsy, and use like emotion, <laughs> intuition. Then our guest here is a guy who could have been in Challenger scene this season, but actually he retained his spot in, in LCS. It's Dexter, jungler of CLG. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing okay, yeah. I've been up all night watching Worlds, and I'm pretty tired now, but okay. it's okay. Well, you were up yeah, all night to have fun. To have fun, yeah. Watch yeah. these entertaining we, games. We were up all night to get dandy, though. That's the question. So That's... we're going to talk about the games here. <clears throat> the first game, and obviously the premier one, the one that everyone wanted to kick Worlds off with, EDG against Samsung White. Everyone predicted Samsung White was going to win. Like I don't actually know anyone, even Chinese experts have said EDG would win. What did you actually think of the game, Dexter? Like, did EDG did they have more than you expected? Was it what you expected? What do you think? Mm, I think for the most part, the game was pretty one-sided, and then Imp decided to go full YOLO and decided to throw it twice, but yeah, I expected it to go that way because Marta was just outclass like Marta and Dandy were just outclassing the opponents so hard. It's not even funny how how much better they were and it was kinda close the game, but in the end it was pretty obvious that Samsung White is gonna win pretty convincingly. So yeah, I expected the game to go that way. I mean that I'm really curious. was yeah. I'm curious what you thought of the rumble pick, Dexter. The, the Rumble pick made a lot of sense, I think, because Rumble used to is a really good counter against Maokai, and I'm pretty sure that they have been practicing against it, like with it too. And Rumble and um, Kha'Zix together have a lot of synergy because the second the W from the Kha'Zix hits, he can just engage with the Rumble ultimate. And they had two immobile carries on the solo lanes, like an Orianna and Maokai, which are kind of immobile. So. The team comp that Samsung White ran was actually really, really hard to play, but at this level of play, I think Samsung White is the one team that can pull it off. But yeah, they had zero hard engage, they just had like super hard disengage with like Nami, yeah. Six, and Rumble. And I think Rumble actually was very good in that team comp specifically. Maybe they just wanted to have fun or test out stuff, you never know. Maybe they're just like, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter, we get top two anyway, we can try our stuff and see if it works. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that Maokai, they expected the Maokai pick and then countered it with Rumble pick. Well, I even thought, though uh, they had uh, the Tristana, which everyone has been hyping as like it's broken and all the rest of it, actually, when you looked at the bottom lane, it almost looked as though they gave the EDG players what they wanted. They want their AD carry to have a good lane, and they want him to get late game. They had a, they had a favorable matchup there in theory. It looked as though maybe the Koreans were like feeling out EDG and seeing what EDG would do with the champions they wanted, you know? Yeah, I think s- maybe. I mean, I'm not sure what happened there, but... Yeah, I mean, Nami got the the Lucian Thresh matchup into the Nami Trist one, and I think Lucian was supposed to win that lane kinda, but he died I think on, like after Na- Mata flashed for him, and then yeah. after the first death, it was it was kinda hard to come back from that. Well, that play alone, I mean, that's like a, that that play like summed up the strength that. Samsung White has against EDG that no one else does, which is that they don't just have a good AD carry, they have like the best bot lane. Yeah. And so the difference is when Nami and them are playing against even an Uzi I bot lane, they know that like, okay, Zero is not some god of support. So they still have a chance to, there's some wiggle room there. But if you remember that play there, they actually essentially like baited them in so that when the death sentence came in from um, FZZF, then actually that's what turned the kill for Samsung White. It wasn't, it, Nami yeah. was like half health already. I mean, <coughs> one thing is really important to know that how picks and bans went. I mean, Samsung White, they banned on Jenna, right? And Jenna is supposed to be the best zillion counter in the game right now because Jenna is very popular among like top teams because of her disengage and she does very well against zillion support. And what Samsung White did was they picked zillion very early with Kha'Zix together in the first rotation. And I assume that Edward Gaming thought they have to face the zillion support because of the Jenna ban, which was like next level. And then 
they packed like, like their two other good picks into Zillion. One is Thresh because of a kill lane. If you want a kill lane, then you can run Thresh or Nami. But I think Samsung White last picked Nami then, which made them like Nami is really good against Thresh. So it was like an insanely good pick and ban phase actually by White. And I'm not sure if it was intentionally how they did it, but it's just something to think about that this one Jenna ban made actually the difference between the. It could have made the difference between the bot lane matchup. And yeah, but yeah, I mean, Imp kind of outclassed Nami on every level in that game, besides his two suicide deaths, <laughs> which almost cost yeah. him the game. I thought, I, um, I thought actually that Samsung White's combo was like really good against Orianna because they just kind of all spread out, and then you have the Zillion ult and the Rumble in the center, and then from there, like there's, there's. Like, we didn't see a single good Orianna ult the entire game, and I think that wasn't really yeah. him playing badly. I think yeah, that it was. just, like... Uh, it was. You think I mean, it was I, just him I being think there? you played, like, the most underwhelming Orianna in the... Like, I've seen in competitive play. I mean, every Orianna today well, was kind of underwhelming, but... Yeah, exactly. It, it felt like he was choking, I think. He was missing so many great... He had opportunities to pull out, like, insane shockwaves, but he was not holding on to it long enough, and then he choked and only got, like, one or two people, or the Orianna ultimate got flashed or whatever, but, yeah, I think it was not, like, him, uh, Samsung White playing good, it was just you playing, medio like, pretty average, like, below average Orianna, I think. It was nothing special. And maybe if the Orianna would have been used better, or by a better player, or whatever, like, played better, then they might have had a chance to win the game, actually. Because their teamfight comp was actually pretty good, you know? Like, having the Javan, Orianna together, and then the Lucian with the mobility to clean up. But, yeah, I mean, it's something wide again, like, who they're playing against, so I can see why. Maybe just because they got he got outclassed by, like, a lot in that matchup, but, yeah, he, his Orianna play wasn't really impressive. I thought the Javan play also wasn't really impressive. Yeah, the Javan had like zero pressure in the entire game. I mean, even it had like a decent score, but Javan, he didn't know what to do. He was just running around really indecisively while Dandy was Especially just... Especially early. In the early game, he got like, he was level 3 at like 5 minutes still, while Dandy was just on his way to level 6 and hit it like at 6.30. And you can't do that against the Kha'Zix, especially if you have a Zillion in your team. Like, Zillion Kha'Zix together works insanely well because all Kha'Zix needs is like level 6. And with level 6, the W involvement and W max very popular right now, you can actually start contesting objectives. And yeah, the, the second, like, then he hits level 6 and Looper hits level 6, there should be no way that Edward Gaming can actually contest any objective anymore because it's just so strong how they work. And even if they don't have any hearts you see, it's still insane that team comp, like, how much damage it can do. But yeah, I mean, I was very unimpressed with Clear Love's Jarvan play, but he's supposed to be a super good jungler, I mean. I mean, I played against him last year. He's like top 10 in Korea in the Korean ladder with like 70% win rate on the ladder. So I expected more, but maybe in the next game, he will show more. I mean, it was against Dandy, to be fair. And like you yeah, say, he was playing yeah. Javan and he got behind, <laughs> and then the other guys ahead on Kha'Zix. Like, that's like a nightmare matchup, right? Yeah, it is. If you play. And any Dandy's Kha'Zix is, is fucking better than a lot of people's Kha'Zix right now. A lot of people are like middle ground on it at the moment. Yeah, it's true. It's true, though. But. At the same time, there's no good, good jungle pick against Kha'Zix. Kha'Zix just wins every matchup. Yeah, it's default. I think Kha'Zix. <laughs> and if is you have, so yeah, if you just have a Zillion in your team too, like every jungler knows what I'm talking about. If you play against a Zillion, and you do one mistake as a jungler, and the enemy jungler gets one kill or something, or he gets like more farm than you, or you fail one gank, then you fall behind like two or three levels, and that's what happened in the game. Then he just farmed up was cool with just hitting level 6, and Klilov didn't know what to do, he tried to counter gank, or was very indecisive, and then he fell too far behind to do anything anymore, and yeah, Zillion is just stupid, I really hate this passive, and it contributed a lot to the fact how the matchup went, actually. One thing I didn't like, though, was that it seemed like some of the commentators, like, went overboard on Nami. They made out as though he had, like, a bad game, or he was exposed yep. or something. If you actually look at the, the totality of the game, yeah, he got killed in lane, by like a great play, but the best support player. Yeah. Otherwise, actually, he he did, was pretty good in the second half of the game. He was the main reason why they actually were able to win fights. Like actually, what what's weird is even though overall, EDG got convincingly beaten in this game. I thought it had some really good signs in it. Like it showed that even when they were massively behind, their team fighting was actually superior with the comp they had. They knew yeah. exactly the limits of it. There was that one play where. I think FCZF like lanterned Nami in to get the kill near the Baron pit. That was fucking insane. Like yeah, they had some really nice plays in this game. Sure. I was really surprised by the one thing where I think he had Ghostblade already, 
Nami had gold, ghost plate on yeah. Lucian already, and then he was just eing into the mid lane and kind of forced uh, who was it pawn out of lane, and that got them the tower for free basically, which was was a really really good play for him because he just chunked the mid laner for free with like really good positioning, and off of that they snowballed actually like even when they were behind at that point, they met, made something out of a bit bad position uh, bad situation, and they got the tower out of it, which was really important, and yeah. Mami played like pretty if, solid, yeah. I have to admit. Like, if any other team was in that sort of a scenario, but with less of a lead, I, I could see EDG winning these games if it goes late game. Like, to me, Samsung White is, like, the, <laughs> the worst team for them in the whole tournament because they have all the counters for them. They have the super sick jungler. They have the the ultimate bot lane. So they've counted the, the, the biggest weakness of EDG in theory and their biggest strength. Whereas if... if if this EDG team goes up against like Najin White Shield or Samsung Blue, these are teams that are it, it can, it's, they can be competitive with them. I think from what we've seen, uh, I think White's biggest weakness is probably team fighting. That's why Blue always has the upper hand against White because Blue is just oh, a team yeah. that goes 40 minutes. Okay, let's team fight, boys, and then Blue is just even if they have a gold deficit for like 5k, they're just that much better in team fights. And like you said already in like before that, Chinese teams actually have super good team fighting, you know, and maybe that's the one. Like, Edward Gaming might be the one t game, uh, team that could take a game of wide in this group, yeah. Like, the thing is, when people... Okay, the one the thing that people kept stressing on the commentary and analysis was like, oh, Samsung and White, they're so cocky, they always get cocky. Oh, look how cocky Imp got. I don't actually think that applies, because it's one thing if you, like, you normally play a certain way, then one game you get cocky. That's just their style of play. Like, you're saying there they're not that good at team fighting. That's their style. They just beat the, they beat you up so badly early in mid-game that it doesn't matter late game. They just win the game anyway, versus everyone except Blue, basically. So, yeah. to me, that's part of their style. It's like, once they have you, like, pinned, they try to just finish you immediately. They don't wait and try and out-rotate you and grind you out. They're, just, they're never going to play that way. To me, that's, like, the weakness that comes with the strength in a weird way, you know? Like, I, I expect Imp and them to keep doing the same thing in the next games. Yeah. I, I mean, I expect... I expect that, that uh, Samsung White will 6-0 the groups and then actually win Worlds. So I think they're the strongest team at Worlds right now. But maybe they lose a the game. I don't know. Who knows? So, okay, the second game of the day was the one that unfortunately was spoiled by Svenskeren having a suspension of three games. So it would have actually been potentially like a 50-50 game for some people. Instead, I just want to know, what did you think of Gilius overall? He had problems, in, right? In that game, specifically? Yeah. Yes, uh, he had Kha'Zix and he didn't do anything with it. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, but I mean, at, the thing is, lanes. he. You have to admit that he, this guy didn't has like zero competitive experience in like on a stage, and he didn't do anything. But at the same time, he was not like a super like the biggest problem in that series was probably just overwhelming synergy between Amazing and Bjergsen. The second, like, he just level three ganked him. He lost his like Jesus lost his flash. Then level four, he comes again. And kills them, and then after that point, Bjergsen was just completely smashing mid lane, which made it really yeah. hard for Gilius to do anything. But at the same time, he didn't really use the advantages he had in other lanes. Like for example, top lane, Freddy was winning the lane, right? He he was like incredibly tanky already. He had like double giant spell, and he could never die, and he was actually winning the game. So maybe he should have realized that faster, as a, like, and then go there and kill them. But overall, he had like zero pressure. I think with Kazik especially. Usually when you have Kha'Zix at level 6, you can start pressuring stuff, but he was just sitting there and farming, and I feel like he just had the mindset going into the game that uh, he's afraid to make plays. He just, he, like, it's better to not lo like, lose anything, you know? He just didn't want to die on, or something. He just wanted to play safe, and you know, he couldn't really do much in that series, I think. Even, I mean, if he would have had more experience, maybe he could have done more, but uh, I don't know, it feels weird. He didn't have any pressure. But like I said, but his, it's hard to do anything in this position. His, yeah, his solo lanes were Orianna with heal middle and a Mundo top against an Alistar. He couldn't, I don't think he could gank either of those. And then they had Sona bottom. Mm, he could have counter ganked middle maybe, but like... Yeah, that was the biggest problem, I think. Like, if I would have been there and I would have studied TSM, I was like, okay, let's level 3 or 4 counter gank mid lane. Because yeah, exactly. that's, that's how TSM wins games. Like, that's the only way how TSM wins games at the moment. Because they just have like... An incredibly synergy between Bjergsen and Amazing, and if you can counter gank the mid lane, Kha'Zix just completely shits on Lee Sin actually in a counter gank. And Orianna and Kha'Zix should have won the 2 and 2 in mid lane really hard because Yasuo is not super good level 3. He doesn't really have much damage, and especially if you have heal, you can just, yeah, 
he should have counter ganked. Like he should have read it that there will be a gank coming and then play around it. But that's like the only thing he could have done, maybe. Yeah, so I mean, my joke analysis of that game would obviously be congrats to the fourth European team for beating the third European team at Worlds. But jokes <laughs> aside, actually, one of the things about that game, I thought actually the guy who really let the team down was actually Jezus, unfortunately. I think he was the, the, most, the biggest hole on the SK team. And actually, if I'm being fair, I think, I think Jezus' problem is he doesn't play mid laners the quality of Bjergsen that often. Aggressive, really skilled mid laners. Like, the best mid laner in Europe is Froggen, who's not going to go super aggressive in a new. Yeah. Meanwhile, a lot of the really good mid laners, we don't actually even have an LCS at the moment. We don't have Nuke Duck, we don't have Alex Hitch, we don't have Power of Evil, Pet Featherburn. All these guys who, in theory, are quite high level. At the moment, the, the talent in, in LCS itself in Europe is a bit more sparse, and it's not really the super aggressive skilled style. And so. I think Jezus got a bit shown up in that game. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean, definitely, he got crushed by Bjergsen. He got completely crushed in that matchup. <laughs> I, I don't think he knew. Like the thing is, the way Bjergsen played it, he actually played it super well. He just hit every Q. He always went in for the Harris, and then I think after the first two games, Jezus was just afraid to do anything, and he misplayed that matchup quite a lot as Oriana, and it feels like he didn't know what to do in that matchup. And yeah, every time Bjergsen went in with like double E onto him, and yeah, he didn't know how to respond or how to trade back. It felt weird. But at the same time, he was just too afraid probably to just do anything because Amazing is always there in mid lane and Kemp's Bjergsen's lane. So I, there's, we can skip over the third game, Dark Passage versus AHQ, because the only people who care about that game is AHQ and their, their loved ones. So we'll go straight to game four here. Taipei Assassins versus Starhorn Royal Club. Now on paper, Starhorn Royal Club should just roll over this. They were the second seed from China. But actually, TPA were like going to win this game for a while, right, Dexter? Yeah, I have to admit that the game, Wins is really good. Like, Wins the jungler is, I mean, he's really, really good. He's probably like the best non-Korean jungler right now in the world, and he kind of carried that game pretty hard for them. But then, I don't know what happened. They decided to throw, I guess. Just weird Baron calls. They didn't do anything. Yeah, they did that classic thing that, you know, when it, you know the, one of the best things Monty does is during his casts, he always updates you on two things. One, what the win conditions of the comp are, and then yeah. two, who is scaling better. And if you hear Monty do it, every, every bronze player can suddenly become a genius because they're like, oh, I can see how they're going to get outscaled now. When I was watching that game, you know, Dexter, I've watched like every CJ players game ever. Yeah, yeah. And then because Shield play that style, I've watched every Shield game ever as well. And every time there's a Rise playing who hasn't nice. been beaten up for the first 20 minutes, I'm like, okay, start the clock. 35 <laughs> minutes, like, let's see. Th and then, like, and that's a game where if you're TPA, you look back now and you're just like, well, we actually had 10 minutes where we could have won the game there. And just not winning the game is what lost us a game, essentially. Because how could you let the Rise and then Uzi I just get to those items, you know? Yeah, I mean, at first I was really... I mean, I didn't know if the Caitlyn pick was that good because basically Caitlyn is not that good at the moment. But after the game goes on for a while, it actually made a lot of sense because usually I did actually a lot of work in that game as Caitlyn. And then yeah, you have a rise on your team. Eventually, you can't team fight anymore against a rise with four items, right? Because you will just one on five your whole team. So yeah. I mean, the, the big rise play to me was that one at the bottom tower where he just went in and killed Bebe, who was like obviously the guy who had yeah. to stay alive if you were yeah. TPA to win and that. And then uh, again, we just saw the Chinese teams at team fighting are fuck, they're insane once it gets past like 30 mm. minutes. Yeah. Like the fight they had at Baron, that was nuts. You can just see that every other team in the world, it's like you have to, you, I think every other team has to have like that game plan. Unless you're Korean, you have to know like you can't leave it till t team fights that can be decided. Because even if the Chinese team has like a 40% chance to win the team fight late under normal rules, that becomes like 50% or higher when these teams fight somehow. Yeah, I mean, just TPA is showing like a like lesser performance of closing out games. And then there was this one Baron fight that shouldn't have turned out this way. And it's like, all right, what happened? And then Royal just kind of crushed from there on. So yeah, I think TPA misplayed it a bit. But at the same time, I wasn't really impressed by anyone on TPA, but wins pretty much. Like, wins carried that game pretty hard for the first 30 minutes or something. And then after 30 minutes, he can't really do much. And then he had this one insane flank, actually, on Oriana, which was kind of, should have been game-winning, but then again, TPA... One where he was... kicked them into the mid-tower? Yeah. And then, I mean, that should have been the game-winning, like, thing, right? And they had a super high advantage, and, yeah, they didn't pull it out, like, they didn't 
abused the fact that they have such a big advantage and then Royal just kind of stomped them after that and after they got their first like few items on Rise, it was all about the game, pretty much. Spellsy, I forget who you predicted, but are you one of these people who doesn't believe in some in Starhawk and Royal Club? No, I have I have them at first in groups. But I actually thought after this after watching this game, I thought they looked pretty weak. Like their early game was kind of bad against TPA and and like the mid laner died for no reason and then they got like three owed bottom lane or whatever. And so I actually expected going into the TSM game, I was kind of afraid my prediction was going to be wrong, and TSM might have pulled like an upset or something. Well, but then don't worry, obviously, they, they give you that false hope. Obviously, <laughs> with the I think the Starhorn we saw in this game was completely different than the Starhorn we saw in the in the last game. <clears throat> in the, in this game, they were much more passive early game, and they kind of just like waited and and kind of only won with like this kind of late game team fight comp like you guys are talking about, compared to like the like. Super ham team that we saw in the in the last game with Rengar. Okay, so before we get to the TSM Star and Royal Club, we have to talk about actually what's great about Worlds is it's like sort of not just a World Championship, it's a festival of esports. And so what they had was they had like a special charity match between before these two games, and they let these like amateurs come up and play the game, and uh, they got to play against their heroes from Samsung White, and they said like you so, know yeah. to make to make this fun, you know, sort of like a. Sort of like when the Harlem Globetrotters play, you know, we'll give the advantage to the team of, of stars so that they can really show the crowd what they can do. And, you know, there was sort of some alley-oops and behind-the-back passes. And No, but this game, white against HQ is a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I actually looked at, like, some of the... Because they had, at, at 10 minutes, they had a 7K gold lead, right? Which yeah. is crazy. So I looked at all of the NA stats to see what's the second high, what's the highest lead in any NA LCS game, and it was 3.5k by like some LMQ game. So they like literally doubled any lead in any North American LCS game. That's like how hard they crushed the I mean, early game with the ace at level one. The tribash what won in the series pretty much. I mean. Nothing to do. Let me ask just you this question, Dexter. Everyone now, like I say, using yeah. bronze analysis, everyone will just look at the result and go, oh, what an idiot. Why would you go and do that? And all this? Trying like a level one cheese if you're AHQ against Samsung White's well, probably a good idea, actually. Yeah. My question would be, what are the odds that you actually would have just caught Samsung White like across the, the buffs and lanes separately and they would just be on their own? Do you, do you think Samsung White would have always been paired up like that? Uh, I think Korean teams play very... Like, they never invade really as five people, or they never do level one plays or anything. They just fan out. Like, they just play as standard as possible level one. But I think the Blitzcrank pick kind of gave it away that they just want to do something. And like, they, like a pull blue or something stupid. Yeah, like, Samsung yeah. quite knew that if they, the second they picked Blitzcrank, they were like, okay, they're going to do some really dumb shit at level one or try to win the game that way because there's no way that they can actually win the game when they play normal lanes, right? So I think this was like, was like a sign for why that they might do something really weird level one and they, they just stacked five people up because they knew they have a better level one than the enemy. So, I mean, yeah, for me, the Blitzcrank pick kind of gave it away, the level one cheese that HQ planned. If they wouldn't have picked Blitzcrank and something else like normal support like uh, Nami or something, then maybe it would have turned out great and they wouldn't have had that tribush ward and eventually they would have get an uh, advantage in the bot lane or something with a kill. Who knows? But yeah, I think the Blitzcrank pick kind of gave it away. What they this game was like porn for like a jungler though. Dandy's Lee Sin just like popping all over the map, like solo <laughs> yeah. killing people. Even yeah. when they were 4 b wanting him, he still killed someone. Like, it's like a junk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think Danny had a lot of fun. Like, I saw the player camera and he was just constantly laughing. I was like, all right, let me style on these noobs, blah, blah, But yeah, he, he had a lot of fun this game for sure, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's go to the last real game then, which was the last... TSM versus Starhunt Royal Club. And both teams had had a win, but one yeah. more convincing than the other, obviously. Going into this game... I would have, I, like, I, for me, this group, to me, the most interesting matchup in the whole group is all the junglers, because in theory, you have four yeah. high-profile junglers. And so to me, that's where TSM's in trouble in any of these matchups, is that in theory, their jungler might be one of the few guys who can be exploited. So in this matchup, we had the, the infamous Insec, and he was on his Rengar, which has been his pick when he's in China, because with yeah. Insec, he plays the super damage Rengar, and he just goes ham on you, he just goes in on you all the time. And in this game, it worked brilliantly, right? I mean... Uh, TSM banned Lee Sin, right? They have to ban Lee Sin because uh, Royal was on blue side, and I'm pretty sure that Insect would have just... picked it, I think, yeah. Royal, like, Insect would have for sure first picked Lee Sin, so it was kind of must ban, which kind of 
I mean, if you go by stats, right, you always like to bring up the stats that Amazing can only play two champions, which, blah, 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 you know. Oh, so, no, give him credit. I think he won, like, three games on Nunu as well. So nah, he's working like, on that third one. <laughs> Just give him no. time. He's working on it. Put, put those stats aside. I mean, I think Elise was a bad pick here, actually, because they knew, okay, Rengar is being picked, and Kha'Zix was still open. Kha'Zix would have been perfectly fine in that pick, and... It would have actually made a lot of sense because they picked Rise and Z in first rotation, which is actually a super popular thing to do because the Z gives enough pressure in mid lane to have the Rise farm up, and then you can just play one three one that way because Rise can just sit in the lane farming up to like twenty five minutes, thirty minutes, while Z already can split push against anyone, right? And then you have a strong three man of Nami, Corky, and Kazix. If you would have picked Kazix, which would have been a really really good team comp, but yeah, like I said, he had Elise, and then he just farmed against the Zillion already. And if you just decide to farm it out against the Zillion, you're going to have a really bad time, because the experience advantage eventually kicks in, and if you team fight, you just have like a two-level deficit on every single row. And I didn't really understand that, because he could... But he didn't have any gank, like any lane to gank, pretty much, and then he just farmed it out, and then eventually the bot lane thing happened, where Insect counter ganked his gank, and after the 3-0, was like, okay... Insect is just gonna style on them right now because he's so far ahead and yeah. they got a lot of experience from that. And then Insect did this crazy play where he just shit on top lane 2 with the flash, the first gank. I mean, this game kind of shows that Insect is still like the jungler with insane mechanics because he did some really crazy sh stuff in that game. And yeah, I think TSM just got like Insect just completely count like crushed this game pretty much. This one yeah, the funny one. thing was, on the scoreboard, you'd have thought, if you didn't see the game, that Colo was the guy who carried the game, because he had all the kills on the Aurelia. But really, they were all kills that came because of the Insect plays. So, like, yeah, he got super rolling, but it was actually the Insect effect. I mean, the sad thing for TSM was, you never really got to see what Bjergsen could have done on Zed. Like, everyone was thinking, like, wow, they've given them Zed. Like, yeah. that's the potential for a TSM win there, right? Yeah. I, yeah, the second they got into the game, I was like, damn. TSM actually has a really good comp. I like both of their comps, you know. I actually like both of team comps. And then you have Bjergsen on an assassin, that, like that his probably best champion right now with Syndra. And I was like, oh, damn, if this goes, like, kind of even, this match can go either side. But, uh, yeah, the second Irelia got, like, three kills in the bot lane, I was like, okay, Irelia can just one-on-one Z probably in a split push. And Irelia just got too far ahead to deal with Z, And then Z could never do anything. And, like, if you go by stats... Bjergsen had insane farm in mid lane. He had like one yeah, or two SS at like 11 minutes as I said. I was like, wow, this game is actually going to be really hard for Royal Club to win because he has those, they have to deal with Zed somehow and Zed is already super big. But then Irelia got three kills and Irelia got the Triforce eventually and then completely shit on Bjergsen in the 1-on-1. -on -one. And after Bjergsen died, which you never see usually in the 1-on-1, -on -one, like Bjergsen is insanely good. He will never die in the 1-on-1 -on -one basically. And after you see Bjergsen dying... I mean, he was playing versus, like, a 5-0-1 earlier at the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, if you know that Bjergsen dies 1-1, then you know the game is over. Because at this point, TSM can't do anything anymore. Because they rely, yeah. they rely too much on the Z-pick in this matchup to do anything. Because Corky got completely shit on bot lane. I mean, I saw, like, a 25 CS difference at, like, 7 minutes in bot lane. Yeah, he was and 25 CS down at 10 minutes. Or 10 minutes. Or, but um, I think... We or we talked about this earlier. How to to beat like TSM? They could have they should have counter ganked middle and kind of shut down Bjergsen. I think Royal Club went the other way, where they just killed everybody else's lane and left Bjergsen to farm middle, and then like everybody yeah. else just got too fed, and then Bjergsen was like, "My team's That's just true. feeding." <laughs> well, the yeah. thing is, TSM aren't famous for like being a really good team at grinding a comeback. They usually win by having like solid lanes yeah. and then go into team fights. So actually any of these Chinese teams who face them who have good early game, if they were to play like OMG as well, mm -hmm. these actually teams probably have the formula to potentially beat uh, TSM because you don't let them get going into where they want to be, you know? Like they couldn't make the picks work for them even when they go good picks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. I think bottom lane is... I think TSM should have maybe lane swapped or something because they just got crushed bottom lane and then even well, after top lane they got the good Elise gang. You you can't lane swap when you have a Rise. You don't want the Rise to be in the lane swap because Rise just if he doesn't get farmed, yeah. there's no purpose of picking Rise, right? And they already locked in their strategy when they first rotation Rise set, so they had to pick a stronger bot lane. Which I think Koki Nami is actually fine. I think, but yeah, yeah, they lost to a Tristana. Yeah. 
Just on a yeah, right. on a Janna. But, How okay. do you lose to a Janna? I think Janna is good against Koki. Like I, I think Janna is actually really good against. Koki. I'm not like an expert really? on my matchups, but yeah, I think what what I've been told to is like Janna is actually pretty good against Koki. Plus, you are playing against Uzi Eye, and you've got Wild Turtle on your team, so. I'm not sure the champions entirely decide that, Spellsy. I think the players yeah. playing them have something to do with it as well. Yeah, yeah at the moment, right. obviously, Wild Turtle's in, still in a slump to some degree, or he hasn't figured... Mm -hmm. There's something he still hasn't figured out about how to play in this team. Like, he just looks so... Sh Even in big wins, he's never really dominating, it seems. I thought he's good. I think he's still really good, but other AD carries just got... I don't know. Maybe gets a bit overshadowed by some, but I th still think uh, he is pretty good. But yeah, he didn't really show up in this series. I think his lane phases, his weakness yeah, his, or whatever, and then he sometimes throws yeah. like imp style and from the first... His lane phase is definitely his biggest weakness right now, because we saw it in the C9 series and all the way through to, to playoffs. Like Even when they played LMQ, Vasily completely handled him in the bot lane, right? He was actually getting kills on him in the 2 and 2, so yeah. it's like the one weakness he has, like he doesn't have a strong landing phase as other super good AD carries, but he makes up for it, like other things, because he's always super solid, he usually does his job, right, he just doesn't go for the crazy plays like other AD carries, but I still think he's good, like this. I mean, come on man, you've got to have a pretty good landing phase if you're an AD carry, you've got to be able to get that CS. True, I mean, yeah, maybe. That's a pretty big weakness to have. <laughs> It is, yeah. If you go into a mid game with the 100 CS deficit or whatever deficit you have, then yeah, you're basically fucked. But, you know, yeah, I guess his landing phase isn't the best one. I mean, which, listen, once he gets to team fights, yeah, he's very solid. There. That's why he's yeah. always been good. He's always been a good, good at outputting damage. I mean, yeah. when you say that he does all these other things, I mean, listen, maybe he's awesome at that. Maybe he gets up early in the morning, he cooks pancakes, people wake up to the smell of pancakes, <laughs> he's got the orange juice on the table, back rubs for everyone. Listen, don't worry about the CS difference. We're all it's team <laughs> spirit. We're all together. We all agree to stick together for two more years, right, guys? 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 <laughs> anyway, jokes aside. Actually, I have one more thing to say on this show, and then and you can tell me if you've got any final thoughts. I have one thing I just want to set straight for the world. For some weird reason on the cast, Jat and D-Man had a little conversation where they explained that Pawn really isn't a Yasuo player, and that you shouldn't think of him as a Yasuo player. Pawn is like a god on Yasuo. He might be like the second best player in the world on that champion. The reason he doesn't Yasuo player is... First of all, it doesn't sometimes fit what Samsung White plays, and they make their picks go to other people. Yeah. And secondly, sometimes it gets banned. Here's a statement. Here's all you need to know about Pawn's Yasuo, okay? That everyone agrees Dade's Yasuo is the godliest, right? It's the best in the world. When they played against Blue, White against Blue this season, every single game, Blue banned, uh, White banned Yasuo against Dade. Then the other game, Blue banned Yasuo against White. So if they're banning their own player's best champion, you know that other guy, they're worried that he's going to first pick it and he's going to be amazing. Yeah. Supposedly, Pawn's Yasuo is like one of those scenarios where you just don't know he's amazing on it if you only look at the stats because he never gets to play it. Like, you're going to ban it every time yeah. against him, you know, because he's that good. So it's one of those weird ones where it won't show up in his champion pool because he's too good at it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in the first month or something where Yasuo came out, I think both Pawn and Dada had like 500 games combined on Yasuo. They, they were ridiculous. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that both of them scrimmed like Yasuo exclusively or something, because Pawn is like an insane Yasuo player. I know that for a fact, because everyone talked about it on broadcast and like OGN is like, oh, Pawn. So yeah, I don't get that. I think Pawn is actually like a super, super, super good Yasuo player. I mean, he has really good mechanics, but yeah, like I said, it doesn't fit the team comp often and why does more that team that doesn't go for late game, they go more for like the early game thing, and Yasuo isn't really the best pick all the time in the early game, because he needs some time to ramp up, and he needs like two items to get, get going. So I can see why they don't go for the Yasuo pick always, whereas Blue, Blue has a more late game oriented team fighting style where Yasuo can shine, and... Plus, you need Dade to make the plays, you know. Bond's yeah. job isn't to make the plays. His job is just stay alive, do well in lane, that's about it. Everyone else is going to carry the game, dude. Well, mm -hmm. Pawn had some really good one. Like, his laning his, was really, really good, too. I don't know. People forget that he actually exists, like, between Faker and Dada, but Pawn's laning is actually super solid. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. when, when we're in Korea, like, you could see that he's actually really good on lane and... 
he gets like discredited a lot because he gets outshined by Dandy and he has Imp on his team, right? And he has Mada, so people often forget that Pawn is actually insanely good too. It's just like the overall around package that White has that makes him pretty good. So I've got a question for you. Tomorrow, Dexter, TSM yeah. plays TPA. You just said today Wins was really good. You saw the game they had against Star and World Cup. Can TPA beat TSM tomorrow? Do you think it's possible? I think it depends on picks and bans a lot. I think if you pick away Lee Sin or ban it out from Wins, then actually Wins becomes a bit less of a factor. And maybe Bjergsen can... I think Bjergsen will outshine their mid laner for sure. And I, I think TSM might, will win against TPA, yeah. If they just ban and pick accordingly and don't get outpicked, then I think TSM will win, yeah. Yeah, I okay, think TSM will win as well. Any final thoughts on today's play before we wrap this mother up? Mm, I think today was actually... I expected more from Dandy. Like, I was... He got, like, two games. Really? Couldn't re yeah, I was like, he got, like, two games where he couldn't really show how good he is because that one Kha'Zix game was good, but... I don't know, and that you can't count in the other game, but I expect Dandy to, like, in the course of the tournament to be, to, like, really show why he's the best jungler in the world right now. And, yeah, I'm actually really excited for tomorrow's game. It's okay that sooner or later they'll get, they'll get to play some foreign teams, don't worry. Then, then we'll see how good Dandy is. Then we'll see the Dandy show. Yeah, the Dandy. I was waiting, for, like, I was so hyped. I was like, damn, White is going to play two games today. I will see the Dandy show. But, yeah was really cool. But yeah, I think tomorrow's games, I'm not sure how well SK Gaming is going to do and if they even decide to pick Svenskan as a jungler, right? I mean, he has three ban like three games ban. So yeah. that's like the one question for SK Gaming, right? If they decide to go with uh, Svenskan the other three games or not. That's like I think you have to, surely. Yeah. Especially if they lose all three of their games with Gilius. True, but yeah, I mean, you don't know how the team decides, but other than that, I think TSM has a very good shot of making second in the group after Royal. That's my prediction. And then first group is pretty much Edward Gaming, like White 6 0 in the group, and White, like Edward Gaming second. That's my thoughts. How the groups will turn out, actually. So. Okay, any final thoughts, Spelzy? No, I'm. Do you, do you guys think that uh, in the next round of Edward Gaming versus Samsung, it's going to go the same way? Hmm. I find that it's really hard to tell because on one hand, I think Edward Gaming will certainly realize like you have to be super focused on what's going to happen early to mid game versus white. Otherwise, we're never even going to get to make our effective late game work. And at the same time, I actually think that white will just go even more ham on them early because <laughs> they'll know that like if it was even there, then we might be in trouble, you know. So actually, I think it's good in that sense. But it, what makes them, even though white's a big favorite, what makes the matchup good is that both teams totally know which part of the game they're supposed to do their work in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think Samsung white looks kind of unbeatable in the group stage, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, everyone can watch this VOD later if they miss some of it. And Summoning so Insight should be up reasonably soon. I'm not sure when it's like processing or something, so maybe an hour or two. I'll, I'll give like a vaguely professional ending here. Like go to the Facebooks and the Twitter and all that good stuff. But all the same, let's just end it here.